Amen. Well, we want to welcome you out to Fremont Missionary Baptist Church. We are delighted that you have chosen to come out and to worship with us tonight. God is on the throne. Can I tell you that? 
I believe we need to hear it. I'm telling you, we've had a busy day. Uh, we've had a lot of things going on. My goodness, just over the last couple of hours, we had some severe storms, kind of worried about that. There's just been a lot that's been going on. And maybe you're like I am. You're just a little bit tired. Uh, maybe you just need a little boost uh, as we come into the presence of the Lord. So I, I want to just encourage you tonight to focus on God. Can I tell you that Jesus is still in the boat? Can I tell you that he's still there in our presence? The Bible tells us that there was a time when the disciples got out on that boat and they were out in the storm and the Bible says that they were there and it says in the Bible that Jesus was asleep in the boat. He wasn't bothered one bit by the idea that they were in the middle of the storm, but Jesus, Jesus was there. Can I tell you Jesus is there? And the disciples, kind of like you and I, have a habit sometimes of coming and going, Lord, where are you? They went to the Lord, and they said, Lord, you're sleeping. Do you even care? They said that we're going to die. Jesus arose from the bow of that boat, and he stepped out, and he just looked at the major storm, and he said, hush. He just said, hush. I'm telling you, my friend, we need Jesus to say hush today. We need him to say hush in our lives. We need him to say hush in the problems that we face. We need him to say hush in our country today, and we need him to say hush in our world peace be still among us today he is still the god of peace he is the one that we can trust in and i'm excited today that we can come into his presence and bow before him and just give him some glorious praise lord i feel your presence right now father we come before you today and we thank you God, for who you are. I thank you, Lord Jesus, you still calm the storms. Father, I thank you today that no matter who's listening to my voice, no matter what problem they're facing, Father, you are adequate today. You are able. Father, you can minister to their needs. Father, I pray you show yourself so mighty and strong. Father, i got a friend of mine right now whose mother is up in the hospital. Lord, she needs a healing touch of your hand. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I would pray that you'd be with Miss Becky. I pray that you'd be with the doctors and the nurses and the staff and giving them clarity of mind and stillness of hand. And, Father, you guide, Lord, everything that they do today. Father, I pray for the many among us who have fallen sick. Lord, but whether by cancer or COVID or other measures, Father, I know you can bring healing upon their lives today. So, Father, I pray, Lord, you reveal yourself within their lives. Father God, you touch them in a powerful way that they may know your comfort today. They may know your peace. Father, some of us are weary today. Oh, Lord, uh, we just need you to carry us along. Sometimes, God, we don't feel like we can go any further, but you're the God that will see us through. So, Father, we pray in our weakness you pick us up and make us strong, Lord. I pray in that moment of darkness, Lord, to be the light that we need to see. Oh, Father, I pray, Lord, when we feel so alone within our lives, we realize, Lord, your presence is right there with us today. Hold us in the palm of your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to just uh, go through a few of our announcements that we've got coming up this week here in Fremont and at our church. Uh, first of all, I want to mention the fact that we've got a good Friday communion service. That's going to be online only. Pastor Travis from Cornerstone Church and myself will be host hosting that here in our sanctuary. And we're going to have a communion service for Good Friday. And so we'll put that out online. Uh, we encourage you to get a little grape juice, get yourself a little bread, doesn't matter what kind of bread, uh, it just shows the breaking of the body of Christ, but get those elements, have them available, pick a time when you can do that, in sincerity and in quietness, now, don't do it when the kids are all running through the kitchen and you're being distracted, take a moment, find a peaceful moment that you can stop and remember what Jesus did that day that he was on the cross. We're going to have Saturday at 2 o'clock here at the church. We're going to stuff some Easter eggs with candy. And so we want you to come out and supervise the pastor. Make sure uh, that they go in its proper place. And so 2 o'clock, you'll want to come out and be a part of that and just help us as we'll be stuffing maybe four to 500 eggs that we've got back there, putting candy in those. And so you come out and help us get that ready for our Easter Sunday service. Of course, we do have our Easter Sunday service. Let me say it clearly. We're going to begin our service at 1030. Our Sunday morning service 
for this coming Sunday will be at 1030. And I know, Peggy, somebody's going to walk in here at 11. But I'm just saying, nobody's going to be able to say that old pastor didn't tell us. It starts at 1030. We've got a lot of special music. We've got a special children's sermon going to be given. Uh, we've got a lot going on, and then we're going to let the kids go outside and get those eggs. And so just a wonderful, wonderful morning, and we will start our service that morning at 1030. We've got an, uh, a baptismal service that is scheduled for Sunday morning, April the 18th. We're excited about that opportunity to be able to baptize and see people profess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to encourage you, if you're here, you're listening, and maybe you're a part of our membership, and you'd like to have that moment where you say, I choose Christ. I I'm dedicating my life to the Lord. I'm taking my stand. Here I stand. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to be able to do that. Baptism is a symbol of your faith. It is an expression of your faith. I remember the day I was baptized. I'm going to tell you, my friend, it was a powerful experience. When I came up out of that water, I knew I was alive to Jesus. And so that's going to be on April 18th, May the 8th. That's a Saturday. We're going to be having a fishing day, and we're going to have it out at Carl and Peggy's farm. We're going to cook some hot dogs over an open fire. Uh, we're going to have a fishing day. There's two ponds out there. And uh, so we're just excited about being able to have that. We've got quite a few worms on hand, but if you'd like to bring your special bait, uh, you do so as well. Uh, we will also have a number of fishing poles available if you don't have some. So we'll try to make sure you have those as well. Come out and be prepared just to have a nice afternoon. Help me pray in the name of Jesus for what? Good weather, amen, <laughs> well, that, uh, that would be important for that day. So at this point right now, hopefully we're going to just have a beautiful day. We're going to pray for that, and we're just going to have a wonderful day in God's spirit. So having said those things and put those before you, uh, let's take another moment and just go before the Lord, and then we'll dive right deep into our Bible study tonight. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, if we didn't have your word and father we wouldn't have the truth father we would have nothing to stand on we would have nothing but opinions tonight but we have your truth father and as we look into the scriptures we see what you have to say and that's the one thing god that matters i don't need to hear the government's opinion i don't need to hear the world's analysis but i do need to hear lord what you have to say so father bless us tonight as we look in your word we're going to need your holy spirit lord to move upon us tonight to teach us from your scriptures in jesus name amen and amen tonight we're going to talk about the topic of dying so that you may live dying so that you may live. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, if you don't and you're online or you're with us tonight, I I'm really going to ask you tonight, please get your Bible. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to actually go get that Bible right now and give you a chance to have it because I'm going to teach you some things. I'm going to teach you some things tonight that you really, really need to see in God's Word. Dying so that I might live. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. It's a concept that the Bible teaches throughout the New Testament. Dying so that I might live. you got to die in order to live. It's a concept that is taught deeply in the Bible and one that we'll see in this passage. Look in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And in that passage of Scripture, it says these words. So I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, I no longer live. I had to die within my life. Something has got to die. That's a concept that the Bible 
teaches. It reminds me of a story. Do y'all remember Jerry Clower? Some of you do, I'm sure. Comedian, went around all the time, and he talked about his brothers, Marcel and Raynell and goodness, whatever else he had of his cousins and his family. And he'd always be talking about to go out there raccoon hunting. And one of those stories that he told, he said that Marcel went out hunting, and he said he shot up there, and, and he thought he had wounded one of those raccoons. And so he threw his gun down, and he climbed up in the tree, and he said all they knew is those lights were shining up at the top of that tree. And Marcel was up there hollering, ah, ah, like that. And he said, Marcel, Marcel, are you okay? He said, Marcel yelled back down, and he said, shoot up here amongst us, one of us. It's got to have some relief. And so, and so one of us has got to die. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches. There's something within us that's supposed to die when we come in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're coming up on this Holy Week, and I love Holy Week. I love a week that we started out last Sunday. We talked about Palm Sunday. We talked about how Jesus entered into the city and they laid palms in his presence. And we praise God. We thank God for coming to be our deliverer, to be our sacrifice within our life. And we saw that and we rejoiced as we saw him coming into the city. But then we go on into Holy Week and it becomes darker as we go along. We find that Jesus was in take it. We find that he was placed on an old rugged cross. And in this time of Holy Week, we focus on the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, on Easter Sunday, we focus on the fact that he's no longer dead, but indeed, he's alive. But we spend a lot of time talking about the death of the Lord Jesus. I preached on that last week. We talk about his sacrifice, and it's important that we do. We need to understand the price that was paid. We need to understand what it cost God to pay for our sins. It was the death of his only son. But I wonder if we focus so much on his death that we forget about ours. You see, because the Bible teaches a concept in this passage of Scripture, for when he died... We did too. It's not only just about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, if that's all you accept is his death, but you don't have one for you tonight. My friend, you missed the point of what Christianity is all about. Not only did he die, but so should you. There's a part of us that is supposed to have died within our lives. And I believe the reason we struggle so much in our Christian life, I believe why we have such a hard time living for Jesus is because we're still dragging dead things around in our life that have already been taken care of by the cross. Something needs to die. And so if I tell you tonight, the Bible says you've got to die in Jesus' name. What does that mean? Well, we, we stumble a little bit at this moment because we hear the scripture and we say, Paul says, I died unto him. But what does that actually mean for us today? I want to try to give you some tangible things that you can take home with you that will help you to understand what it means to die for Christ. There are several things that I want to point out in these passages of scriptures that I believe that we need to die to tonight. The first thing I want you to see is that we are to die to the reign of sin. We are to die to the reign of sin. Turn with me, if you will, over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. I'll give you a chance to turn to it. I want you to see it in the Bible. I want you to read it with me. This is God's word. What I say don't matter. What he says does. Chapter 6 of the book of Romans, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer? Or do you not know that as many as are baptized unto Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk today in newness of life. It says we are to die to sin. 
We are to die to sin in our lives. My friend, I want you to understand, we've got to ask ourselves the question, what does it mean to die? What would be a good definition of death? Cessation of movement, maybe? Ain't moving no more. I mean, that would be pretty good. What about this? Unresponsive. You ever hear medical services calling a report? The victim is what? Unresponsive. I think that's a great definition of death. It is unresponsive. <laughs> See, I can tell you something, my friend. When you die, you're unresponsive to the elements that are around you any longer. I'm telling you, that'll preach. See, yeah, you can take old Joe that was addicted to alcohol for 30 years, but when he dies, you can pour the alcohol on him, and it don't matter no more because he's unresponsive today. You take the drug addict who's been doing drugs for years, but when they die, they're unresponsive to what's being put in them any longer. I'm telling you, when he says that we're to die to sin, oh, we got to be unresponsive to it. Amen? We got to realize, my friend, that we got the ability to turn it aside. I want you to understand what I'm preaching to you tonight is not the absence of the presence of sin. Sin is among us. It always will be. But I want to preach to you the absence of the power of sin. It don't have power over you anymore. I'm telling you, you can respond and you can turn it away by the power of of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be unresponsive to the sin and the temptations within your life. We are supposed to die to our sin. Oh, there's some things I want you to learn about sin tonight. First of all, it's inherited. <laughs> it came through the bloodline. Amen? It ain't something you just picked up and it ain't something you can just lay down. The Bible tells us that all the way back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned, and from that moment on, sin was passed down. Sin is inherited it's in the genes it's in the dna it's in our lives so it's there but i want you to understand something about the presence of sin in our life as well it's not only inherited but it's insistent as well it's demanding isn't it boy sin won't show attention and it will set up for nothing less it's demanding within our lives. My friend, when we are apart from Jesus Christ, sin calls your name and you come running. And sin is insistent. It is demanding in our lives. You see, I want you to understand that that's why the Holy Week, Monday through Friday, all the way up to when we, we look at the crucifixion of Christ every single week, that week of every year, I fast the whole week the whole week because I put aside something I put aside my flesh I put aside those things that I would normally put in my stomach and put in my and enjoy at the table but I can tell you one thing my friend when you do that you'll understand just how demanding your flesh is am I selling a lie Helen we were on our way back from Raleigh today and I told her I said man I can smell <laughs> A sausage, egg, and cheese biscuit at McDonald's while I'm driving by. Because I'm telling you, when you ain't had food in three days, <laughs> food looks mighty good. But listen, I want you to understand that sin is inherited. Sin is insistent. It's demanding in our life. It wants you to go get something. You realize just how demanding your life really is. Every time it says it's thirsty, boy, you pull in there and grab you a soda pop. Every time you think you got a little hunger pain, you go in there and get you a nab or you get you a hot dog, you get you some. You all the time trying to satisfy your flesh, all the time trying to feed your body, all the time trying to do all those things. How much time have you spent trying to focus on God? It's demanding in our lives. Thirdly, I want you to see not only is sin inherited and sin is insistent, but it's insatiable. It'll never be satisfied. You'll never get to the bottom of the bottle. It'll always need more. Whether that bottle be alcohol or drugs or whatever it might be, my friend, it will always want more. 
And that's the way sin operates. It is constantly pulling at us and within our lives. But I want you to know that this passage in Romans chapter 6 tells us that we died to sin. We can be unresponsive to sin. And though that sin is in operation within our lives, we do not have to obey it. We do not have to follow its call. Jesus Christ has set us free. We die to sin in our lives today and God truly does set us free a second thing I want you to see about when it says that we are to die in Christ first of all we die to sin we die to sin secondly I want you to see tonight that you're also to, supposed to die to self you need to die to yourself you see there's two factors working to keep you away from God number one is the sin around you and number two is the pride in you is you and so I want you to look in this passage. You just see to turn one page. Romans chapter 7 and verse 15. Romans chapter 7 and verse 15. The apostle Paul is writing of his own struggle with this idea of sin in his life. His own struggle with who he is and, and that fleshly part of himself. And in verse 15 he says, For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I therefore do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin who's dwelling in me. For I know that in me, in my flesh, it says, nothing good dwells. Romans chapter 7 verse 15 Paul says there's some stuff I want to do amen is there some stuff you want to do there's some stuff in your heart that you know that you really want to do for God you want to serve God boy we all got good intentions don't we we wake up every morning thinking glory to God we're going to serve him today and then all of a sudden my friend's life gets in the way all of a sudden, you get them phone calls at work. All of a sudden, somebody yells at you. All of a sudden, everything goes wrong within your life. As the proverbial saying, all hell breaks loose in your life. What in the world is happening in this place? Apostle Paul says, I, I struggle. I struggle every day. You see, well, you need to understand today that just like Paul, we not only struggle over sin, we struggle over self. I want you to understand that in your lost state, apart from your relationship with Jesus Christ today, you are the one on the throne of your life. You're the one making all the decisions. You're the one driving the vehicle. You're the one running the show. But my friend, when Jesus comes into your life, there is a change in management. I'm telling you, Jesus takes the wheel. Oh, he takes over our lives but you got to understand that when that happens there's a part of you that pride part of you that'll rise back up and try to take control again and again and again in your life Paul talks about this he said man there's so much I want to do and I don't do it and there's so much I don't want to do and that I end up doing and he explains here the struggle that happens in every one of our lives as we struggle with that spiritual side of our lives. It reminds me of the man who had two dogs that were out there trained to fight. A neighbor came up one day and he looked at them. He said, if you put them two dogs in the pen together, which one do you think is going to win? He said, the one I feed the most. The one I feed the most. What are you feeding in your life? Are you feeding the flesh or the spirit? Because, my friend, either one of them is growing stronger and having more control of your life. We need to understand that we are to die to sin. We are to understand that we are to die to self. We've got to make up our mind that we're going to take ourselves off the throne and we're going to allow God to be leader of our lives. That means you can't spout off like you used to. Amen? That means you can't do some of the things you used to do. Why? Because it ain't your life. It is Christ. And we need to understand that self had to die. It is no longer responsive to sin. And if that truly has happened, then Jesus is the one making the decisions. Jesus is the one who's running 
the show. Oh, my friend, I'm telling you, we need to do away with self. You say, well, how am I supposed to do that? You drag that dude to the altar and kill it. Kill him. Everything about you, everything that's in you, everything that is against God and is trying to get you to do things that the Holy Spirit is telling you ought not to do, you drag it down and you nail it to that altar and you leave it there and say, die. Paul said, I buffet my body that I might be obedient to the will of God. And that means to beat it. Whatever I got to do, Paul said, I'm going to do it. But I'm going to make sure that I'm submissive to God. You say, well, what if I struggle the next day? Drag that dude back up here and kill it again and again and again and do it every day till you see Jesus face to face. It is a struggle within our life. But when the Bible tells us to die, you need to understand it means that we're to die to sin, unresponsive to sin in our life. We need to die to self. Quit trying to run the show. Quit trying to figure it out. Some of y'all are struggling so much to figure out what tomorrow holds. You ain't even got a good hold on today yet. Trust God. Learn to trust God. It's not about you. You don't run the show. God does. Let him be on the throne. The third thing I want you to see, we got to die to the reign of sin. We have got to die to the rule of self. Thirdly, I want you to see, we got to die to that relationship with Satan. You got to die to that relationship with Satan. Let me tell you something. You may not understand it. You might not even be willing to agree with me, and that's okay. But I'm telling you, my friend, that apart from Jesus Christ, before you asked Jesus to come into your life, you and the devil were buddy-buddy. You were. He pulled a chain and you'd respond. You did everything he wanted to do. He had you right in his back pocket. You were his best friend. And I'm telling you something, my friend, that relationship needs to be broken. You need to quit listening to him whispering in your ear. He is no longer your friend. He is no longer your partner. He is your enemy, my friend. And you quit listening to what he has to say. Oh, he's leading you into corruption today. He's leading you into sin. I'm going to tell you something. He has had thousands of years of practice. And my friend, he knows just how to present the bait. We're talking about going fishing here in about a month or so. Going out there, Peggy, we're going to throw some, some worms out there and try to fool them old fish. And maybe we do good, maybe we don't. But I can tell you one thing, the devil's an expert fisherman. And when he throws corruption, when he throws sin out there in your life, he knows just the right bait to use for you. He knows just what your weakness is in your life. And my friend, we got to say no to him. We got to die to that relationship. We got to kick him out. We got to cut him off and get him out of our lives. Always oh, going to come at you trying to get you into corruption today. He's going to try to lead you into complacency. See, the devil ain't scared of no Christian that ain't doing nothing. And so if he can get you to just sit there and have no ambition for God, to have no ambition to serve him. To have no ambition to grow in your relationship with him. He's perfectly fine with that. He'll leave you alone. But my friend, the minute you decide to grow in Jesus, the minute you begin to do something for Almighty God, I can tell you, my friend, you have got his attention. Oh, I'm telling you, the devil's out there. The devil's out there. And he is not your friend. The Bible teaches us that he's out there and he's looking. He's looking. The Bible says he's like a roaring lion. Remember that verse? First Peter 5, 8. Like a roaring lion seeking whom he may. He's looking. Oh, but my friend, I want you to understand he's also listening. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. The devil's listening. He's looking for weaknesses and he's listening to your conversations. He's listening to what you say. He's looking. He's listening. Oh, but my friend, can I tell you, he's lying. He's lying to you. And my friend, everything he's trying to sell you will take you down to the path of hell. Everything he's trying to sell in your life is not beautiful, and it will take you to a deadly end today. I'm telling you, my friend, there's nothing he wants better than to drag you all the way down into the pits of hell. I want you to understand there's got to be a changing of the guard. 
you got to allow Jesus Christ to be the one and the only leader of your life. So can I ask you tonight as we look at what it means to die for Christ, what it means to really die with him, because that's what Paul says we got to do. He says, I died with him. What does that mean? It means that you got to die to sin and be unresponsive. If you sin, it's because you choose to. It is not because it has power over you. I don't care what it is in your life. You've already been set free. You need to understand that sin coming in your life is a choice of yours that you make every single day. Day. I want you to understand maybe you're struggling with that area of sin. Maybe you're struggling with self. Maybe you're struggling with self. Maybe you just want to be in charge. Maybe you just understand tonight that there needs to be less of you and more of God running the show. That it's not about you anymore. Would you lay that down and die to it? God wants you to die with him. Die to sin. Die to self. Oh, but then kick the devil out and die to that old relationship that you had with him. Quit listening to him. Give him a bill of divorce and be done with it. Send him packing and be done. And tell him he doesn't rule here anymore. Oh, but what do we do with the sins we have? What do we do tonight with the things that have come in our lives that are displeasing to God? I share with you this last verse of Scripture as it's found in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Having wiped out the hard writings and requirements that were against us with every contrary thing and taking them and nailing them to the cross he nailed it listen he nailed it to the cross every sin every failure everything you ever did bible says he nailed it to the cross you got to choose to leave it there you got to choose to walk away and my friend, if you're willing to do that, I promise you, I promise you tonight that Jesus set you free. That's what he came for. That's what we celebrate at this Easter season is that he died for you and that he's here to set you free. My friend, maybe tonight you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe tonight you're hearing my voice for the very first time. You got to think, what does that old crazy preacher got to say? Well, he wants to tell you about Jesus for a minute. I want to tell you about one. Who came to this earth, who died on that cross. He loves you so much just to set you free. And my friend, if you'll just simply call upon his name, he'll save you tonight. From your sin, from your burdens, from your problems, from everything in your life. So tonight, if, if you're wanting to receive Jesus, if you've never asked him into your heart, would you just simple, say a simple prayer after me? Father, I come to you right now, and I admit that I have sinned. But today, oh, Lord, I believe when you died on that cross, Lord, you died for me. So, Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, cleanse me and my life, and I commit my all to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. My friend, if you said that prayer, the angels in heaven are rejoicing, and so are we. I would invite you that if you're online and you said that prayer, that you'd put in the comments at some point tonight that you did that so that I might continue to pray for you. For all of us that are Christians, we're just dragging a dead body around. We're just dragging a dead body around. Because if we're still living in our sin, if we're still struggling with those issues that used to be part of our lives before Christ, we're dragging dead things around behind us. And can I tell you, it's beginning to stink. Let's bury it. Let's leave it. And let's let Jesus be first place in our lives.
Can we pray? Father, we come before you tonight. And, Lord, I just want to take a moment, and I want to thank you, God, for loving us the way that you do. Father, I thank you, Lord, that, God, even though you died, we die with you, God. That old person we used to be, Father, doesn't have a single heartbeat. Today we've been set free. But, Lord, the old devil tries to convince us it's still alive, but it's not. So, Father, give us freedom from the sins of our past, from the reign of our own selves. Oh, Father, set us free in our lives that we might abundantly live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Have I told you lately that I love you? Because I do.